So now we'd like I'd like to talk about uh, Tristan Tate, and he's been approached by a lot of people on the right on the internet because he's he's newly involved in this podcast that he built on Rumble with his uh, brother Andrew Tate. And of course, as anyone who starts uh, the process of podcasting, there are a bunch of people in the chat who come and who say, hey, are you red-pilled about the Jewish question? Uh, Have you looked into it? Do you realize that what you've been talking about in terms of the matrix uh, very much has been discussed by people interested in the question of the Jewish contribution to our cultural phenomena. And ultimately, are you, are, are you taking a position on this? And Tristan Tate's reaction on video, I saw it a couple of days ago. I didn't comment on it, but now he's reacted also on Twitter. It's basically a denial and the classical, what do I care? What do I care if... Jews are successful. I'm successful. They're successful. What do I care? I want to explain to him, and I think he's a good faith guy, because you know why? After I tweeted my tweet explaining, laying out the reasons why you should care, he actually followed me on Twitter. So thank you, Tristan, for being a guy who appears to be interested in honest engagement and rationality. Although your emotional denial at the beginning when people approach you with this question, totally understandable, you know? Sometimes this question is so emotional and we've been so much trained onto this taboo that you cannot discuss this. That it is normal for any normal person to just emotionally reject this subject once or twice. But what really makes you a man is your willingness to find the truth after, to kind of walk back and say, hey, you know what? Let's see what's the best argument for this side. And I tried to lay out for you, uh, Tristan, five reasons why you cannot understand society. You cannot understand the matrix until you understand the question of Jewish power and, and Jewish uh, overrepresentation in many industries of America. So here's what I told him. Uh, well, let's start with what he tweeted. So he was referring to his video uh, response to the question, and he said, my answer was a non-answer. It wasn't supposed to be convincing. It was supposed to wake people like you up and realize that spamming Twitter about the JQ isn't going to get you where you want or change a thing. I've got hundreds of millions of dollars and a fantastic life. The fuck do I care if a Jew owns my bank? Nick himself is a self-confessed incel. He's talking about Nick Ferentes here. Nick himself is a self-confessed incel, no? Of course, he talks about Jews all the time. I'm busy talking beautiful women on dates. Jews might own my restaurant. Who cares? You don't get it. So to be clear, Tristan, the, the people who are alarmed at Jewish power and the Jewish question are not telling you it would matter in any industries and it would matter if they own your restaurant. That is not the point. I said, this is an example of people being intentionally obtuse on questions that relate to Jewish people because they don't want to face reality. Here, Tristan, is why you should care about certain industries being subjected to overrepresentation by a given ethnic group. One, it raises the question of whether a meritocracy based free market is operating in that industry as opposed to an ethnic cartel. For example, free speech on social media. I was banned for years for talking about this question. The only thing that brought me back into the public eye is Elon Musk taking back Twitter. But when I was looking at who was banning me and who was banning my friends, it's it's always been very apparent that it was mostly Jewish women at 
trust and safety uh, departments of a list of various social media. They were making my life hard. So whether you deserve your number of followers and the attention that's given to you, or whether it's a network of people who are controlling which IDs will get the most exposure, is an extremely important question. We must make sure that ideological conversation on the web and in life in general is not subjected to an ethnic cartel, because the ethnic cartel will inevitably censor what's against their political interest and will let succeed what is for their political interest. So that is the first reason why you should care about the ideological, cultural, and ethnic constitution of the entire system of censorship, social media, shadow banning, exposure, public conversations of all kind. Number two, it raises the question of whether hidden political agendas may influence the quality of the product in ways that the consumer may not be properly informed about. For example, someone reading the New York Times but not aware that the coverage will be favorable to a Jewish outlook on society. That is a problem. Uh, I've spent so many years of my life believing thinkers, reading thinkers, until I realized at one point that they, they were completely irrational on a given subject. Like Sam Harris. I was like, okay, I'm following what he's saying in this book, in this book, in this book. And then he would say something about Muslims, and I would be like, what the fuck? H how, how do I take the thinker that I know and that I've been reading about, and how do I explain that he would reach this conclusion on Muslims? That, that he would he would be totally bigoted against Muslims. Or how would I how would he conclude to be so deranged by Trump, by the rise of Trump? And the only thing that, that I could figure out that made me click in terms of my understanding of all this, and, and there are other thinkers that, that I was confused until I figured it out. No, they think of politics from a Jewish perspective. It changes the whole rational system. It changes the way they look at it. And ultimately, when they surprise you with, with something that you could not have predicted, you will understand, oh, I have Christian cognition. I have Christian belief. I come from a Christian family. I think of the world in a certain way. They think of the world in a totally different way. They think of it, for example, in relation to Israel. They think of themselves as being in a war for existence against Muslim nations that are around them, and they consider themselves under threat. I wouldn't consider myself threatened by Muslim nations, but they do. So for understanding the world better, it's important that when you read intellectuals and when you read the media, that you can tell the difference between which media is Jewish or Zionist, and which is not. Number three, it raises the question about loyalty to the tribe when it comes in conflict with loyalty to one's function. For example, Michael Cohen, Trump's attorney, betraying him. There are so many stories out there of what we could call handlers. They are people who work in the staff or they work for someone. There were cases with Kanye West where they feel that they have a one-to-one -one interaction that is honest with someone. Uh, in the case of, uh, and, uh, in the case of uh, Kanye West, yeah, uh, it was this Andrew Pasternak guy who was a gym, uh, a gym counselor of yeah. And eventually the mask falls, and eventually Andrew Pasternak, because Ye was going, was trending on an ideological direction that he didn't like, he started threatening Ye's family. He started threatening Ye with psychiatric imprisonment against his will. And Michael Cohen was another case where he's the employee of Trump. He should be loyal to Trump. But eventually Trump becomes too much of a Republican, too much of someone 
who was anti-war and who was against globalism. And eventually Cohen just turns against him, starts making up crime, trying to drag Trump in the process. Uh, he was unsuccessful for much of it. This is a case where you can seriously ask, were these people more ultimately in their heart? Were they really feeling that they were on Team Trump or Team Ye? Or were they always on a team that was against their interest? That is one thing that will allow you to understand news events better. Are people feeling that they're part of another team than the one they reveal? Four, it raises the question of asymmetric access to political lobbying leading to enrichment of the group. For example, the overrepresentation in the judiciary and intelligence communities, which both participated in the COVID moral panic and the related censorship, which ultimately benefited companies whose CEOs were, you guessed it. One important way you can understand the COVID moral panic is to look at the players, to look at the constitutions of these big corporations that benefited from fear, from vaccines, from, from both the fear and setting the solution to the fear, the purported solution to the fear, the vaccine, the masks. You look at the operatives in these companies, you look at the CEOs of these companies, and then you look at the media that has, that has cultivated this state of fear into the people, and you realize that it is a whole team of people who had ethnic interests tying them together. It is a whole team of people. The, the, the media was making the job of Pfizer, and Pfizer was part of the team of the media, and Knowing what that team is, that is, in many cases, we are talking about companies that are overrepresented in the Jewish category, is extremely important. You won't understand what we've been going through in this whole COVID thing, the, the whole two years of COVID moral panic, if you don't understand the Jewish question. And five... It raises questions around truth and how our access to it is being manipulated. For example, lies in relation to weapons of mass destruction to justify wars in the Middle East that benefited, you guessed it. Um, Benjamin Netanyahu, a couple of months before America would invade Iraq, was in front of Congress saying to the American Congress, you should really attack Saddam Hussein. I can guarantee the American Congress that a war again that removes Saddam Hussein would have extremely positive reverberations onto the whole Middle East. And eventually we get built, this whole story builds into a big lie that Saddam Hussein has weapons of mass destruction. This lie is told to the, by the media to the American people and used as a justification to invade Iraq, a country that had a couple of jeeps for its army that wasn't a threat to America in any way. All of this was pulled by a series of players from Bibi Netanyahu, the president of Israel, or prime minister, prime minister. So Bibi Netanyahu, the leader of Israel, uh, the media with an overarching Jewish representation, a bunch of intelligence agencies with, over with overrepresented Jewish contingents, and one has to ask, other than Israel, what did these war in the Middle East serve in terms of American interest? Nothing. It, it, it served none of our interest. So we get told lies. We get told lies by a bunch of players we can recognize who work together 
And it's important that you understand who these players are. If you're going to understand American military interventions for the last three decades. For all these reasons, Tristan, it is, and because it touches so much of the teams that you guys are talking, you will have to get interested more than you currently are about the Jewish question. Uh, you will have to get interested in it if you want to be relevant when you comment about the deception of men in our society, because who gets deceived to go into wars based on lies? It is mostly men. You will have to get interested in terms of the deception that is uh, thrown onto populations by the media. You keep talking about how the media is corrupt and wrong. Not only is it corrupt and wrong, it has a bias to it. It has an ethnic bias to it. You will start noticing this when you, when you let these commentators influence you. These guys who came to you on, on your super chats and who ask you these questions, they want, they want your brain to feel good. They, they want to help you figure it out for yourself. But you're going to get to, you're, you're going to have to be interested in this. And especially when I hear you criticize the Matrix, Tristan, you and your brother, uh, it's like, oh my God, what they call the Matrix. Uh, I, I have come to the same questions. I have come to the same revolt against the system. I have come to the same stunning, stunning view of, holy shit, there's a bunch of people that are really evil in this world, and they, they coordinate, they lie together, and they deceive together on their, to their own interest. But you will not advance in your understanding of the matrix as long as you don't get interested into the list of five subjects I've just covered. So I conclude that by saying, so all in all, there are plenty of reasons why you should be interested in this question. It's one thing to bark at the matrix. It's another thing to get interested in the details of the little green characters on the screen. I invite you, Tristan, and since you've been following me on Twitter, perhaps you are mentally open to the ID. I invite you to be like the guy in the Matrix movie and start looking at the green characters and seeing a little more of them. See, seeing a little more of the, the internal structure and the code behind the Matrix. I think you should totally do this. It's absolutely worth it.